The book is called Why Don't You Write Something I Might Read. This is, um, this is an absolutely marvelous book. It is a reader's book. It's not a writer's book. Of course, he writes very well, so it is a writerly book. But more than anything, <clears throat> It's a book for people who love books, right? So that means it's a book for every single person here, yeah? So I urge you, when we're done with this, to go find it in the bookstore. But before we get to that point, what's the title, Suresh? The, the title is, uh, is, a, is an, uh, how shall I put it, unwitting contribution by my wife, Dimpy, who's here. Uh, Dimpy, I... I of course, as many of you know, I'm obsessed with sport. I'm obsessed with cricket. I'm a cricket writer in my day job. And uh, I've written a few books on cricket, but uh, my wife hasn't read any of them. And whenever I'd ask her, why don't you read this book on cricket that I've just written, she'd say, why don't you write something I might read? And I, I took that seriously. And... Uh, uh, in the midst of all the terrible things that were happening during the pandemic, I sat down and actually wrote a book that she might read. And I'm happy to report that uh, she actually liked the book. So it all worked out, worked out well. If ever there was a gesture of love, that is it, right? I've written a book for you, darling, because you will read this. So lucky Dimpy and lucky us, because we get to uh, read it too. So... Given that this is something that your wife might like to read, how did you put the essays together? Because they're very, very much about your reading life. I mean, there's, of course, there are the cricket writers, but there's also Orwell, there is P.G. Woodhouse, there is Albert Camus, there is Paul Coelho, um, Poili Sengupta, Premier Bookshop, Blossom. So, um, yeah, how... how um, did one essay lead you to another? Did you make a list of these are the people I want to talk about? Or how did it go? No, basically I, what I did was I just, I just sat and wrote uh, without any particular plan in mind. I just wrote a whole lot of essays about writers and, and, and books and people and places that were important to me growing up and, and later on in life after I'd fully grown up and stopped growing. And, and uh, I, I thought that I just uh, put it in, I, I thought I would write it in any old order. I also thought I'd sort of put it together in any old order, and I knew that somebody or the other would find some order in that, and, and that, that's my excuse. Yeah, no, that's certainly true. I mean, even if we don't discern an order, we certainly find things there um, that catch our fancy. So I've been browsing through the book. It's very much a browsing book. It's not something you read from cover to cover. Um, so you'll, you'll flip pages and you'll find a name that you say, oh, I know that name, or I don't know that name, and you'll read the essay, or you'll find a word, or you'll find an incident. Um, but it's, um, it's like a bit of a, a treasure hunt, actually, because there is stuff in there that makes you very happy when, when you find it. It's, it's uh, like getting a prize. Um, we were talking earlier, Suresh, about how could you have written this book at an earlier time in your life? Or is this very much the book um, of an older person looking back, not just at the books that they've read, but the person that they have been? Because it's a very revelatory book, actually. You know, it says as much about you as it does about the people that you're reading. Yes, I, I, I think uh, honestly that all writing says more about the writer than what they're writing about. You should know that, obviously. <laughs> but the, the point is that uh, also, I've been also thinking about this, what we just spoke about, whether, uh, I, whether I could have written this 20 years ago or 10 years ago. I, I, I'm not even sure I can write the same book tomorrow. If I sat down to write the same book next week, I suspect that it would be a different book but it would still have the essence. I think the essence would remain the same. I mean, the writers I love and the writers I loved are, are, are still and will continue to be writers I, I, I love. So to that extent, yes, maybe, maybe it, 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 it'll, be, it'll be different, pro, pro, might be uh, different in structure or it might be even different in, in style, but it will not be different in essence. So what do you think, having written this book and having obviously thought about your 
your reading life. Is there something you can identify that you read with greatest pleasure, perhaps, British writers? Obviously, you don't only read sports writers, right? Do you read political writers, journalists? I mean, Orwell is like a punctuation, literally, um, through the book, yes? So your fascination with Orwell, for example, what is that? Well, Orwell, Orwell uh, was a kind of writer, is uh, the kind of writer I think that everybody should read uh, growing up uh, for two reasons, because one is, of course, the content of what he said, but equally for how he said it. I think, I think, I, 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 I feel that he, he's one of the great writers, not to have, one of the greatest writers not to have won the Nobel Prize, and I think he, he deserved it. Because, it, it, because the style, I think, worked against him. I think what happened was he had, he had such marvelous and profound things to say, and he said it in the simplest and most, uh, I would like to use the word, and the happiest language that he could find. And that worked against him, I think, in the end, because you're only supposed to say profound things in a profound language. And, and uh, George Orwell was too easily understood. I think that worked against him. And that, that has always been my my sort of, uh, the, the touchstone for, for all writing, really. Oh, um, the obscure language of Nobel Prize winners is well known. I mean, many of us suffer because we're unable to read that, but you write very, very eloquently about um, a Nobel Prize winner, Bob Dylan. Yeah? Uh, did you think he should have got the Nobel? I certainly didn't think he should have got the Nobel Prize. I was a great no uh, Bob Dylan fan when I was much younger, and I do, and I do enjoy his music, but uh, I didn't think that he deserved the Nobel for various reasons, one of the s simplest being that, first of all, there were better candidates. Of course, there are always better candidates, whoever wins the Nobel Prize, but I thought that uh, it, it, sent a, it sent the wrong message. You cannot give a Nobel Prize uh, just to tick a box or just to fill a quota. And I thought that was the wrong message. Also, I think it came at such a troubled time uh, for, the, for the Nobel Committee, you know, all those scandals and this and that, and they're like, okay, okay, let, everybody will love us again if we give Bob Dylan the prize. And actually, that kind of backfired because people were just like, you know what, we still don't love you. Yeah, and the blighter didn't even turn up to receive his prize. Exactly. So <laughs> adding, adding insult to some more insult. And Patty Smith, who was very eloquent, but not Bob Dylan. Um, also, R.K. Narayan, right? Another uh, writer who you say um, is uh, um, overlooked because of the simplicity of his writing. Do you want to tell us about R.K. Narayan? The, the problem with R.K. Narayan, this is when I was in school, was that uh, a lot of our teachers, English teachers and others, and this tells you something about the kind of society uh, those days uh, would actually say, you shouldn't read R.K. Narayan because he doesn't write well. He doesn't write good English. And, it, and you know, when you're young, you tend to believe your teachers. You, you accept whatever they say. And it took me a while to figure out that they were wrong. It's, 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 a, it's a major sort of revelation when you're young. You, you then realize, oh gosh, teachers can be wrong too. And, R.K. Narayan wrote simply about, about a place that every single one of us knew. And, and all of us could identify with it. And so why should, why should uh, one not read R.K. Narayan? I don't know if R.K. Narayan has read a lot now. I, I, I'm still not very sure if he is. But I'm sure there is a, there is a, there is a core group of R.K. Narayan readers. And it took me a while. And then, and then of course, once I sort of apologized to R.K. Narayan in my mind and started rereading him, I, I, I thought he was a magnificent writer, and, and, and uh, that's another, that's the, 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 the issue of simplicity, I think, somehow works against uh, uh, serious writing. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you're saying, that simplicity or uh, clarity, yeah, somehow means that, oh, you have a limited brain, yes. you know, I mean, you're not smart enough to write big words, and actually, you and I both know how difficult it is to write simply and clearly and to keep your sentences short and still be profound, because we are profound, you and I. Oh, of course, we are. Um, okay, so we have Arkin and I, we have somebody like Orwell, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, John Le Carre, um, and that uh, um, 
you know, when I was uh, browsing the book and I was like, oh my goodness, this is a gentleman's book for gentlemen, right? It's by a gentleman reader for other gentleman readers. But I so love the book and clearly I'm not a gentleman. Right? I may not even be a gentle lady, but I'm certainly not Suresh, right? And yet I was so captivated by so many of the things that were being said. And not only that, I was like, Are, I love all these same people. Right, if I had to make a list of writers that I would want to respond to, Lacare would be there, Orwell would be there, P.G. Woodhouse would be there, but most, most importantly for me, um, Mike Marcuse would be there, right, who is a great, great cricket writer, much in the vein of C.L.R. James, um, writing about the politics of cricket, and surely has one of the best titles of a book ever in the history of the world in any subject in any language. The book is called Anyone But England, right? And it's about cricket. Um, and it's about, um, it starts with the World Cup, that the first World Cup that was held in, in um, South Asia. Um, so anyway, I'm reading all these marvelous things that Suresh is writing, and I'm like, oh, look, look, there's Mike Marcuse. And I read the essay, and it turns out he's met him. You have met Mike Marcuse and yeah, shook Mark, in his hand. Mark, Mark and I were, well, we did, we did that World Cup together. We traveled together. We stayed together with friends in Delhi and other places. And we've also met each other in, in the UK. And when I'd come over to India, we'd meet in, and we'd keep in touch over the uh, internet. And I, I, I thought he was a magnificent writer. He's a magnificent writer because look at his range. He's written books. He's written these books on cricket. He's written about uh, Dylan, to come back to an earlier topic. He's written about Muhammad Ali. And, and, and he was writing a book on William Blake when, in, in his uh, last days. And uh, there, was, there, is a, there is a thread that runs to all, through all of them, which, is, which, is the, which explains, which tells you the kind of man he was, which is an intellectual who, who saw, who saw uh, depth in what uh, would pass off as... as uh, uh, something mild and, 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 and almost unnoticed by the others. I think, I think it's a great quality. And also, I think, yes, particularly in Redemption Song, um, his book about the 60s, um, he gives gravitas to what we dismiss as popular culture. You know, that he's e able to see popular movements as actually the location of potentially very, very large um, social change. And it's, um, he's... Uh, yeah, um, and the reason why I chose to bring him up is because I think more of us should read him. Just as more of us should read Suresh, um, we should also, more of us should read um, Marcusa. Okay, um, we have, you know, we were given 30 short minutes, um, so we decided that we would use up 20 of them and leave the last 10 for you all to um, join our conversation. So before I, uh, before I open this up to questions and comments and adulation um, from all of you. I want to read um, a very Sureshi um, bit. So just give me a second. So I'm going to read a passage uh, from an essay called Master of the Falsely Profound. And as I said, the book um, has Albert Camus. It also has Paul Coelho. And this is an article, uh, this is Sureshi's uh, take on Paul Coelho, right? Um, but his writing isn't all fable and parable and omen and the banal disguised as wisdom. Veronica Decides to Die, for example, is a fine book about a Slovenian girl who takes an overdose of sleeping pills but doesn't die. She wakes up in a mental hospital and is told that she has damaged her heart and has only a few days to live. Faced with death, she wants only one thing. She wants to live. Despite the lapses into Coeloese, a new word, Coeloese, um, today death brushed my face with its wing and will probably be knocking at my door tomorrow, end quote. So despite the lapses into Coeloese, the novel has a feel of authenticity about it. But what happens when the spiritualist turns to sex? 11 minutes happens. 11 minutes is the title. Much humor here of the unintended variety. A favorite, and I quote now, 
we got up and I saw that he hadn't even taken off his trousers. He was dressed just as I had found him, only with his penis exposed. I put my jacket over my bare shoulders. We went into the kitchen. He made some coffee. He smoked two cigarettes. I smoked one. End of quote. And Suresh ends with, fine. But what became of the penis? So that to me is Suresh really, really in a nutshell. Very funny, very erudite. The short, punchy sentences. Um, and always, always the twinkle in the eye. So I, ch I wanted to ask, despite the sort of general lament these days about um, the death of reading um, and that, you know, there's so many other distractions, people have things like social media, etc., that um, bite into their time. Um, there is a tsunami of publications. Books are out everywhere. Every there are so many publishers publishing and more and more publishers publishing as well. Have you ever experienced, I know you read voraciously, but have you ever experienced this phenomenon of sundoku where you have so many books on your bedside table but you're just never able to read? <laughs> oh yes, always, always. There's, there's always the sign of, a, the sign of a, a, a compulsive reader or whatever is that there's always more books unread at home or office or wherever than you have read. I mean, that is a given. You, you cannot, it's a law of nature. Doesn't it irritate you when people walk into your house and say, eh, so many books, have you read them all? Yeah. Yes, you I've, are the idiot for asking me this question. I've, I've, I've written about it. You don't, you don't walk into somebody's house and say, look at all that crockery, have you used them all? And of course, your, um, uh, your profile cartoon, your prof profile picture, the uh, cartoon about... You, you were, so the cartoon that uh, identifies Suresh as Suresh is um, there's, um, uh, there's a uh, bed covered with books and a woman um, on the phone and she's, yes, you know, um, the pile of books by his bedside finally fell over and killed him. <laughs> that, that's his, uh, pro his obituary, I guess, but it's definitely his profile picture. That's, that's a tribute to Ian Foster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.